I am Claire Bidwell-Smith. I'm a therapist. I specialize in grief and I've written five books. So how would you define leaning into grief? Acknowledging it, getting to know it, getting support for it. Skip places in this book that don't you know, resonate with you or, you know, search around for things that do. And so I call out different timelines. I call out complicated relationships. I call out anger and guilt and all these various facets of it. It's like a grief, choose your own adventure. It could be. (laughs) Wouldn't that be fun? (laughs) That would. It turned to page 72 if you lost your mom. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Speaking of a bad joke, I've been, I realized I have a hole in my sock if you're watching on YouTube. So we're going to talk about the grief of my sock next time you come on. Claire, everyone has been on the podcast before very early on. It's a pleasure to actually do it in person. I know. Even though we've obviously met before, but for everyone, anyone that may or may not already know you, which even though I think a lot of my audience does know you, feel free to introduce yourself to any newcomers. I am Claire Bidwell Smith. Uh, I'm a- <laughs> that you are. <laughs> Smith is such a boring last name. I had it's, Bidwell is my middle name. I had to throw it in there because you know, I started writing for Time Out, and I was like Claire Smith. That's so boring, and so I became Claire Bidwell Smith, which was great because I had always hated my middle name, and now I don't. Okay, um, there you go. So the whole juxtaposition there. Is yeah. That, did I use juxtaposition right there? I wouldn't know. Okay, we'll move on from there. I'm not going to... I'm not a writer. Okay. <laughs> Even though we're going to get into her new book, but just to kick case you all didn't catch that one right there. <laughs> uh, I'm a therapist. I specialize in grief and I've written five books. With the fifth one coming in March. Yes. So this, this is a future discussion, but when you guys are listening to this, the book's going to be already out. And... Uh, you know, we'll, we'll give you all the information there, but let's tap into your mind a little bit. What's, so it, it, I'm talking about the book in regards to, I want to let the audience know about what, why did you write this book and what is it covering? I'm really excited about this book. It's called Conscious Grieving, which I know is like, sounds a little like... Smithy? Yeah. But um, <laughs> this one is really like kind of a synthesis of everything I know about grief. Like if I could... I sit with clients day in and day out and I've been doing this for 15 years now. And it's like everything I wish to impart to someone who's in grief, maybe they're newly in grief or they've been, you know, carrying grief for a long time. It's kind of just everything I wish to impart to someone, but I tried to do it in a way that wasn't overwhelming. And, Mm. um, I love this book because I don't talk about myself in this book. It's all written to the reader. Mm. Um, it's like in second person and, um, My previous books, I started with a memoir, which was all about me and the deaths of my parents uh, before I was 25. And then I wrote about the afterlife and then I wrote about anxiety and then I wrote some more about anxiety and grief. And then now this one. Um, But it's really, you know, conscious grieving. I know we throw the word conscious around a lot, but I think I think it's been missing in grief because the way I look at it is that loss happens to us, right? My parents died, your dad died. It happens, this thing that happens. You didn't choose it. You have no control over it. It's this thing that happens to us. But how we grieve and how we move through that process and how we carry loss is up to us. We can Mm. be intentional with it. And I don't think it feels that way in the beginning. You know, it just feels like everything is happening and grief is happening and all of this anguish and pain and overwhelm and all the things that come with, with loss feel like they're happening, but really we, we have a choice in them, you know, and I've come to believe that leaning into grief is the way to move through it, mm. you know, and I think when we ignore it and push it away, all kinds of stuff happens. So how would you define leaning into grief? Acknowledging it, getting to know it, getting support for it, um, really beginning to understand kind of how it works, how you're going to carry it through your life, um, how it's impacting you on a daily basis, on a bigger picture level. I think grief asks a lot of us, you know, it asks us to examine ourselves and it asks us to sit with hard stuff and it helps us re-examine our relationships and the things we want in our lives. Um, I've seen people, you know, get out of relationships they didn't want to be in anymore or change careers or make really healthy, great decisions after loss Mm -hmm. because it makes you realize how short life is, how meaningful it can be. How do you think people don't lean into grief? Like say from the early stages when it just happens, I feel like it's so obvious that you're in your grief because you just feel like shit and feel <laughs> yeah. everything. So is that is that not leaning into grief already or is that just you're just feeling it? And I think usually that that happens, we feel like shit and then we kind of run from it or we try to tuck it away. And when that happens or we ignore it, or avoid it. And when that happens, it always spills out in anxiety, in anger, in unhealthy coping mechanisms. 
I feel is that so is that initial reaction from a lot of people? I think you were talking about a difference of reaction and responding. So is that initial reaction like a survival mechanism to run away from it? Like is that really just is that like running away from the survival instinct? Because I feel like the real survival is leaning into it, mm -hmm. but I feel like the survival instinct is to avoid it, push it away, and continue on with life without dealing with it. So it's kind of a contradiction. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think it is. It I think, as you know, for yourself, like grief is, I think it's just so much bigger than people anticipate. You can imagine what it would be like to lose somebody really close to you. And then you go through it and it's a whole different ballgame. Totally game, different. You know, and, and it's really overwhelming. And you can't always know how you're going to show up in the world when you're going through really big grief. You don't trust yourself anymore. You're like, I don't even know how I'm going to be at a party or how I am at work now or how I am in my relationship. And so that is also really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, we have that instinct to be like, I want this to stop. I want to go back to normal or I want to just be myself again or I want my person back. Um, and when we realize, I think in time pretty soon that's not going to happen mm. then we start to figure out ways to lean into it or we can figure out ways to lean into it for exclusive access to bonus content new episodes and more check out our patreon account for only five bucks a month link is in the description do you have a timeline for this in regards to leaning into grief like is there a, a recognition of when you should lean into grief no i mean i hate that grief looks different for everybody and is different i mean there's obviously so many universal truths about grief but there's also our relationships with the people we lose are different. Our personalities, our circumstances in life, the ways somebody died, all of those impact how we're going to grieve, you know? Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of people who have complicated relationships with someone they lost. Maybe they weren't even talking to the person, yet it was still a significant person in their life or someone that meant a lot to them. And that's a totally different kind of grief to move through. There's so many layers there. Yeah, it's just the timing of everything. I, I was This is a very relatable thing to bring up so bear with me about it. I love Survivor the show Survivor mm -hmm. and there was a show, uh, I was watching this one of these seasons of 2016 and one of the guys is on the show it's been a dream since he was nine years old his mother was a super fan so it was a thing they shared but he's on the show you know potentially stuck there for 40 days he ended up winning this the show spoiler alert and he was dealing with his mom having like a very a stage four or five I don't know what stage she was in of cancer so she was potentially dying but he was willing to leave for the show and he was having these contradicting feelings of a dream was coming true, but a nightmare was happening with his mother. Mm. And it was just so fascinating when he said that and it just made me relate to what you were saying, how just the timing and we're going through different things. And it was just a bizarre contradiction that he was living his and his mother's dream. Like it was for his mom, but with the risk that when he comes back, she might not even be alive. Wow. So it was just, again, it was part of me was thinking, damn, like I wouldn't, I, me personally, I don't know if I would leave for a show, but yeah. The meaning to the show to them was so much more, yeah. even though it was a silly show. But again, it was just the time, like those little events in life, like you could be having the greatest, you could be getting married that week. And then it happens as those contradictions just affect everything in regards to why I think we feel grief so much differently. Even if yeah. you both lost your dad at the same age, same time, or like me and someone else that lost their dad on 9-11, we both lost our dad at 12 years old. But again, the relationships among their family, this mm -hmm. my sisters, their sisters, just affects everything. So there's just so many calculations of just changing how we experience these things. So in your book, how do you approach those differences with writing a specific one book, a set of words to apply to the masses that are dealing with it differently? Well, again, I think there's some universality to it. And I, I'm really upfront in the beginning about like skip places in this book that don't you know, resonate with you or, you know, search around for things that do. And so I call out different timelines. I call out complicated relationships. I call out anger and guilt and all these various facets of it. So hopefully there's something for everybody and you can really honestly flip through it and just find the pieces that you need and that resonate. It's like a grief, choose your own adventure. It could be. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? That would. It turned to page 72 if you lost your mom. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I, don't know, I love the like you... jokes, the grief jokes are so good. You can't make them with anybody else. <laughs> I know. That's why it's like, I don't know if I'm losing listeners or gaining listeners in my humor, but honestly, I don't give a shit. It's you like, gotta I, laugh. I know. And that, that just, that's why I love talking to, I mean, you, you're not even a comedian in, by profession, but I love, I love that because I think... I mean, have you ever talked about that? Does humor, so you, you have a pretty dark sense of humor, <laughs> which I love. I think that's why we get along. But I'm curious, is that something you've ever covered? No, I haven't. No. Connecting humor and grief feeling? 
No, I've read lots about it in bits and pieces here and there, but um, I think it's important. You know, I worked in hospice right after I graduated with my master's before I became a therapist in private practice. I was in hospice and I could not believe the dark humor that went on in like the hospice team meetings we would have every week. With sitting patients down. or specifically? With, no, with the staff, with like the nurses and the doctors and the social workers. I mean, oh my God, the dark humor. Because you just kind of have to. You have to. And it's so important. I just, I just led a grief retreat last week and, you know, I was with my team who we were all facilitating together and we, I laughed more last week than I have, you know, in like the last year. And, there's a, I don't know, I think there's a beauty that comes with being able to laugh about the hard shit in life and the absurdity of life. Mm-hmm. And Yeah, I think it's very natural for me. I don't know where that came from. And again, me, I can't answer if it was like, okay, after I was 12 and that happened, did I start realizing something? But I think it is, it can be, I feel like it can be disguised as a, a coping mechanism, which I'm sure it is, but I don't feel like I do it to deflect anything. Yeah. I I mean, definitely it can be. I have clients I have to watch for because they'll come in and just try to like deflect, deflect, deflect. Um, But I think also it's really important to laugh. It's healthy. It feels good. It's a release just like crying is. Mm -hmm. And when you meet somebody who you know knows this landscape of grief, there are only certain things that you can laugh and say with them. Like, the kind of jokes you and I can make together mm-hmm. wouldn't be funny to someone who hasn't been through a lot of grief and can just no. kind of like go there. Yeah, I know. and I, that's a, it's a very sensitive. So I, I get in trouble sometimes for doing it, but now I've, I've had a little bit of a filter of recognizing who you can say it to. But again, I think if if you, I, I don't, I'm not going to force on anyone, but if you can get to that point, but some people just aren't funny and they just don't have a sense of humor. So <laughs> you're screwed regardless, and you're just not funny. But I think uh, I think it's a good, it's a, it is a good, tr- like it heals. And again, it's, if it's not deflection, it's. It really is a method for you to feel better after a laugh. Yeah. I've gone for regards to anything. I get, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to mention the jokes. So I'll probably get canceled. But I, I, <laughs> I made a joke to a, a girl I was, a girl I hang out with. And she took it. So it had nothing to do with grief. But she had a traumatic situation. But I felt the dialogue. Like she can take a joke. And I, I even after I said it and she laughed, I was, like, I was just pushing the boundary, seeing where I could stop. And she took it really well. But it had nothing to do with grief. It was just it was a trauma. And I just cracked a joke to yeah. see if it would make her feel better. And it did. So it's a very fine line to approach, but I just wonder if there was ever like a scientific measurement towards humor and grief. I think what's interesting is all the people that I know, like really the vast majority of people that I know that work in the grief and end of life space are so funny and so lively mm-hmm. and so just full of life. You know, like I know you had Megan Reardon Jarvis on oh, phenomenal, in yeah. December. She's so funny. Mm-hmm. I do nothing but laugh when I'm with her. Yeah. And she, all she does every day is work in trauma, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Elua Arthur and I can just sit back and like, just laugh all night about all kinds of stuff. And she's a death doula, you know, (laughs) like it's amazing. Um, So much light. I love that discovery. Cause again, when I started this, it was, I was like, I really wanted to tap into the humor, but then it became what it is now. And it's just my stupid jokes. But the, I think that, I think when you see someone able to laugh through trauma and tough situations, it's also a sign of, Oh, okay. Like besides the fact they seem like they've gotten through it. It just kind of dumbs down life, not in a negative, not in a bad way. I think it just sometimes my belief is we can't take this all too seriously, even when it is serious. And I think the laughter makes it more f- like fantasy. I don't, I don't know how to describe it, which sounds like deflection now. But at the same time, I, I just think it's such an important mechanism towards getting through anything in life. You can find the humor, and I think that's synonymous with finding the light in it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Even though it's a dark light. I mean, people ask me and say all the time, you know isn't this hard? Isn't this work hard? Isn't this topic hard? Isn't it sad? You know? And yeah, sure. It is for sure. But there's also like, all of grief is a reflection of relationships and life lived and time together. And so it's so much more than just hard and sad. I, I love hearing stories about the people that people have lost. I love, you know, little idiosyncratic details. Someone at the retreat the other day was talking about her, her partner who died and she was like, he loved breakfast. And like, I just love that. That's so funny. She's like, he wanted to eat breakfast all the time. And, Mm, um, and I love, like, there's so much like sweetness and beauty in that. And Mm. I hear those stories all day. And then it's also hard in my work. There's a hundred percent fatality rate. Like I never, Mm -hmm. every story of cancer ends in death, every car crash, every suicide attempt, every, you know, overdose always death. Nobody ever survives those things. And so it's heavy. It's so heavy. And so that makes me want to laugh and like have a break sometimes, not laugh at those things, but just like, oh, got to find some like 
lightness in life. That's the key difference. You're not exactly laughing at it. You're just kind mm-hmm. of laughing with it. Yeah. Okay, so humor, I think we just beat to death. So we'll move on from humor. <laughs> but the uh, pun intended. <laughs> har, har. Yeah, so I'm curious about, so yeah, I find it fascinating. It's like you've graduated to this. Again, you were talking about your experience, which is important because it lets people in on your experience, which you can relate to. And I think that's beautiful in itself. But it's fascinating. And now you're speaking to people. So how what was your approach with that in regards to like, did, were there, I know you mentioned some things already, but what are the practical approaches that you would say to people that maybe, you know, want to pick up your book and are going through it? Like what, what people is it for? Is it for anyone in grief or a certain timeline or are they feeling yeah. certain things? No, it's for anyone. I mean, I think, I think, um, grief is something you can kind of always keep unpacking and keep understanding. It is something inevitably we carry for a long time. You know, if it's a significant loss, it's something you might carry for your entire life. So there's always more understanding to, to gain around it. Um, so it can be for someone who has a 30 year old loss, for instance, or for someone who just went through a big loss last week, I outline it in four different sections. There's, um, entering into grief, engaging with grief, surrendering to grief, and then transforming through grief. So entering, engaging, Surrendering and then transforming. Mm-hmm. I'm actually impressed. I remembered all that. I, mean, I am I too. Like, that, I was, like I, that was great. I, 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 I was impressed that I remembered it. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually like a mini test for myself. Selfish. I was like, I'm sorry. I'm trying to remember things better. So you enter into grief, and that just happens because you're literally entering into grief. So that's yeah. not even a choice. And so that whole section is about like getting oriented, right? It's so it's so disorienting, right? You're just kind of like, oh my god, where am I? It's like you've been dropped on a new planet. You don't know who you are anymore. You don't know what's going on in so many ways you're is did this really happen are they still going to walk through the door you know there's just so much in that space so it's really about kind of like orienting and stabilizing what is how would you define that like just finding like getting grounded figuring out where you need support starting to really like just see that this thing has happened to your life Mm -hmm. and that you need a lot of kind of support and also how to take care of yourself in those beginning moments Mm -hmm. the first six months, year of a big loss. You, you, most people don't even remember it when they look back. They're like, I was just surviving. Right. I was like, there's all kinds of logistical stuff to deal with. You know, some people lose homes or, you know, your mom having to figure out childcare stuff with, you know, just losing her partner. You know, there's financial hardship. There's going back to work. There's so much stuff that comes with a big loss. Mm-hmm. Um, and just kind of like getting grounded and stabilized is important. That makes sense. So it feels like the logistic stage is getting all your I's dotted and T's crossed. And I think that's when it really starts after that. Mm-hmm. I mean, even though that could continue for quite a while handling things, but that makes sense. Like a recalibration. Yeah. Got yeah. it. And then you start engaging in grief, step two. Right, exactly. And that's when you start kind of getting to know the grief, really looking at the different emotions that are coming up for you, looking at the behaviors that come from those emotions. I mean, that sounds really clinical, but it's like when my mom died when I was 18, for like a year, I was totally numb. And then when I kind of came to, I was so anxious. I was having panic attacks all the time. I was crying a lot. Um, I really kind of needed to start to get support for that, but also get to know like what was coming up for me. Mm -hmm. And this is in 97. And so there was nobody talking about anxiety and grief. There was nobody talking about trauma. And my like World War II era dad was like, you don't need therapy. Just, you know, buck up and get through school. Um, (laughs) Buck up, yeah. yeah. (laughs) That sounds pretty World War II. This is the guy who told everybody when I went to camp when I was seven that they should call me Smitty because (laughs) that's what they called him in the war. And I was like, oh, yeah. Um, (laughs) Does he wish you were a boy or something? (laughs) Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we could uncover that on another podcast. All right, so right now we're engaging in grief. You're so, trapping so yeah, you're boost. starting to like get to know it and like work with it. And like, what do you need to support that grief process? Do you need to be journaling? Do you need to be going to yoga? Do you need therapy? You know, do you, what do you need to like really kind of be able to hold space for that grief? And sorry to interrupt there. That is just trying to break it down. Is that, that takes experimenting, right? Trying mm-hmm. and yeah. be, being willing to try different yeah. things and not giving up because this doesn't work, that doesn't work. Try, try everything, yeah. you know, like I think there's a lot of different 
now, 27 years after my mom died, there is so many, there's so many grief books, there's podcasts, there's, you know, grief experts and figure out which one is your vibe because everyone has a different vibe and like, it's going to offer a different take on grief. So try all kinds of stuff. If you don't like that book, pick up a different book. If you don't like this podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go to Good Morning Podcast, Grief Gang. Yeah, we got plenty. I'll support other podcasts. It's okay. (laughs) But you got to figure it out. You know, you got to try a bunch of different things and see what's going to work for you. Um, If you're not into journaling, don't do it. You know, just like, I mean, I think journaling is great, but it's not for everybody. Okay. So you could recalibrate then you're engaging in it by figuring out maybe what works and you surrender. What does that mean? Then you, then you kind of give way to it. So I feel like, I feel like I fought my grief for a long time. And I think a lot of people do, they fight the acceptance that this is going to be forever, that you like are going to miss your dad forever, Mm -hmm. you know, that you're like going to be 30 something years old at some point and still be wanting to ask him questions and still wishing you had a dad. And That is a moment that's, I think it takes a little while to come around to that realization and the acceptance of it. Mm -hmm. So once you accept it, it's kind of about surrendering to that, right? This is your new identity in a lot of ways. And this is the path that you have in this life. And so how do you accept that and really start to work with it? Is acceptance and surrender the same thing to you? No. And I don't mean like acceptance that this is when I say acceptance, it doesn't mean it's okay, you know, that my parents died. It just means that I'm accepting that this is my reality. Mm -hmm. And like, how am I going to work with that? And how am I going to like figure out ways to be in my life um, without parents and support myself in that, find ways to talk about it. So how do you surrender? (sighs) This topic, topic, uh, the art of surrendering always intrigues me because that's something I feel like I've always worked on, but I'm also like, what the fuck does that mean? I know what it means, but I still have trouble doing it sometimes. I can't tell if I have surrendered to certain things. And I've heard, I hear a vast different, you know, approaches to surrendering. I like w- one approach, even I'm stealing your light right now. One approach I heard with, uh, what the heck is the name of the book? I'm forgetting the name of the book. It might actually be called. Like the go. art of surrender or something. Let go. I'm forgetting the name of the book. But anyway, the one thing was his approach was allowing yourself to feel the emotions and just working through the specific feeling that you're feeling, if it's whatever it may be at that time. Yeah. And it's just allowing it to build up, not just not putting a story on it, not trying to define it, this, that, the other, and then naturally let it pass because at some point that it's going to dissipate. And that was a practice to surrendering at the same time by not running away from it, like you said, kind of going through it. Yeah. And naturally letting the balloon deflate. That is that emotion. That was one technique yeah. that I heard of surrendering. I think it, I think it's helpful to sometimes almost think about the opposite of surrendering. So like fighting it, you know, like constantly fighting the emotions that are coming with grief, like wanting to be, you know, feeling a difference. Like some people will tell me like, I'm crying all the time. And I'm like, that's okay. But they want to not be crying all the time. So stopping fighting that, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, or just thinking about like not holding on to everything so tightly and trying to control everything so tightly, just letting it be what it is, just mm-hmm. breathing, being in it, um, acknowledging how, all the ways it's changed your life rather than wanting and trying to go back to who you were or trying to be some different version of who you are now. Mm-hmm. Um, just being who you are, starting with right here, you know? And I think also too, like really asking what what are you learning from this grief? What are you learning from this pain? Because we fight it so much that we don't want to learn anything from it, but there's actually a lot to learn. Yeah, that's combative in nature. Whenever I try to bring up lessons, this or that, it's hard. It's, I think people are just seeing it through a different veil in different times. Because I mean, I, I, the only, you don't, in my head, you don't really learn from the good times. I yeah. might be par- I might be plagiarizing that from someone I had on the podcast, and it, it, that really resonated with me too. Because it's like you you really, you really learn through the shitty times. Like you learn when you yeah. fail. Like if you're constantly great at something, what are you learning? Yeah, like you're learning an ego. I don't I don't know what, what you're learning there. So it's like inherently there are always lessons in shitty shit. But then it's like I, don't look, I remember even asked my sister on the podcast, which is adorable when she said it too. It's like so what, what was the good from all this? And Gina was like the good. Um, I mean she's like there is no good. But if I had to pick something, that's like a fair response because like it's hard to look at the good from something so bad. But inherently in shitty situations, there's always a lesson. But I think it takes time to find that. And maybe that is stage three of the surrendering aspect and, tr- and, and finding those lessons. Transform, transforming, you know, right. letting it really change you, letting it like break you open in a lot of ways. Um, this idea of like post-loss growth gets thrown around in the clinical world and it's like post-traumatic growth. 
not everybody goes through it, but it's like, you know, the ways you've made meaning out of your loss and the ways I have too, and the work I do. And I, I'm sure we, everyone who goes through a big loss plays that game eventually at some point, if they get to this kind of more transformative side of it, where they're like, would I give up all of this empathy and like all of who I am now and all the ways I've grown to have them back? And yeah, we mm. probably would give it up, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. but sometimes it gives me pause to think about, you know, who I am as a result of all of this loss is someone that um, really doesn't take life for granted. And just, I think it, it gave me an, a side of myself that I may never have reached at least this early in life. And I'm appreciative of that. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, yeah that's, an, that's an important reflection. I always think, I was like, if my dad didn't die, I wouldn't have this podcast. What the hell would I be doing? I'd still be doing real estate for like, I don't need to Yeah, you just get on a rabbit hole. But I want to say that it is really hard to hear about that or even imagine it if you're in the beginning of loss. So if like you're someone who's listening that's really new in this, you don't want to hear about transformation and post-loss growth. And you don't want any of that. You just want your person back and you want this pain to stop. And it's, Mm. and and I address that in the book too. It can be um, insulting almost to be like, oh, transform through grief. Um, (laughs) I'm serious. Um, Like I didn't, I didn't care about transforming through grief when my parents died. I just wanted them back and I didn't want to be going through what I was going through. Yeah, it's important. Don't worry about the lessons off the Some people might like that. It might just have that mentality and see the lessons early on. Yeah. Like I just had a, a guy, but I don't know if you know him, but his, his name, he goes by the name Gata and he's on the, sh- the show Dave. It's a hilarious show. Anyway, he, he lost his parents when he was 18 months. And he said his, on the show, he's like, my buddy just lost his father two days ago and his approach to being there for him. And it worked for his friend because I guess he knows his friend and how we could approach the situation. And he wasn't making it about himself, but it was a perspective approach. And he was like, listen, man, I, I know my parents, so I was 18. Like you got, you had X amount of years of your dad and it could sound harsh to some people. Mm-hmm. And it kind of blended it an early lesson, but he looked at it, there's like, oh, damn, like, I'm, yeah, I'm so sad. But it's like, yeah, I did, I did have, you know, 20, 25 years with my father. So it was like an early lesson approach and it mm-hmm. seemed to work for him. But I, I like that you brought up, you know, certain people, like, don't worry about the lesson, like, just don't worry about yeah. lessons at like that stage one of just skip ahead right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or skip backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I like the idea of even though everyone handles it differently, those stages seem very practical, mm-hmm. at least like a very, it's nice. I think some people want to, they want to know what to do. And I think it's nice that you're being pretty honest about, you know, this might not be for you. So skip along or go in a nonlinear direction. Yeah. And that is important because it isn't linear, but at the same time, a lot of people want to know, what do I do? I know. And even if they see what you're telling them, it might not apply. It's like, yeah, skip around, but like, here's some kind of structure. So mm-hmm. having like a skeleton approach of this is what you can do and then, you know, rewrite it yourself. But I think that's why it's so important to identifying stages yeah. and inherently it could be like, but that doesn't apply to everyone. No, of course you're not saying that, but it's nice to have some kind of Just structure a framework. to it. Yeah. Something yeah. to hold on to. I think we love the stages because they... They seem like this easy formula, right? Like, oh, if I could just get through these five stages of grief, I'll be better. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's why they've stuck around for so long. But I think they mix a lot of people up too. They put, you know, well, first of all, we don't go through all those stages necessarily in that order or at all. And then there's other stages that aren't mentioned in those mm-hmm. five. And um, a lot of people start beating themselves up. I'm always really blown away by how much, how hard we are on ourselves when we're grieving. Why are we so hard on ourselves? I mean, I should know this answer. I've been a therapist for 15 years and in grief, but like, <laughs> I still haven't really come up with a good answer of why we beat ourselves up so much for for grieving and and struggling through loss, you know? I, I think that... I might do you begin- have the answer? Uh, yes, I do, actually. So stay <laughs> tuned until the end of the episode when I tell you everything. Uh, no, I think, <laughs> I think... Subscribe. Uh, I think I was thinking, you just, again, I do a lot of this stuff on the fly, so you're triggering certain thoughts, but I think I wonder if it has any approach to, like, I'm sure it's been grieving for like, forever, but I think today's society in general, it's so easy to compare. So I think that even gets extrapolated more, especially grief. You know, maybe I'm just noticing it more because I'm in the space and a lot more now in, in the public light, I guess. And just with social media and people putting their lives out there more, I think we compare ourselves even more. So I think that outside of grief, I think just being hard on ourselves and comparing to other people, that person is doing this, that person is doing that. So that adds a pressure that we create for ourselves. And I wonder if that due to the times affects grief in the same way where people are doing certain things and I'm not doing that. So you're starting to compare yourself to other people, maybe in grief or not in grief. Therefore it adds a pressure on ourselves. So that doesn't answer your question. I think we just naturally are hard on each other. Why? I don't know. But I, I wonder if that societal effect 
has even added more pressure to the grieving process. Absolutely. I think that's definitely a piece of it. I mean, we don't, we don't adequately support people who are grieving, right? We tell them to get back to work after three days. We, you know, stop asking about their person after a few months. We um, just don't show up for people the ways that we need to in, in grief. And we don't recognize how long loss lasts and um, all the different facets of grief. And so that that just in and it of itself sends a message to the person who's grieving that they shouldn't be feeling the things that they're feeling because mm-hmm. they're not being recognized externally. Yeah. I think it's also, that's another point that you just reminded me, I have to text my friend Benny because it's, it's interesting how, you know, you get a lot of, you get, some people don't get the support, but you do, when you do get support, it does come in that the bunches and it does start fading away. So I want mm-hmm. people to actually understand, Hey, maybe don't take it the wrong way, but also expect that that support is naturally going to decline. Mm-hmm. Maybe not for everyone, of course, but I do think that's just life. Like everyone, like how I can't really expect everyone to be constantly checking in on you at some point. I think does that lead to more loneliness because of that transition? Because maybe you're getting that support and it's great, but then your grief goes on for X amount of time and then you're not getting those text messages as much. People aren't checking in as much. So I I think that's some kind of acknowledgement to be aware of that. And Mm -hmm. because if it just hits you out of nowhere, you're probably gonna be like, where is everyone? Then you're really alone. It might recycle the grief. Yeah, it's so lonely. And it it does, it can really reactivate some of that. And um, I just hear all day, I've run a bunch of support groups online and I hear from people in every single group, I run groups for child loss, um, partner, spouse loss, mother loss, and father loss. And like in every single one of those groups, they talk constantly about just things people say to them or things people don't recognize. You know, I had that grief retreat last week again, and there were some people who had, you know, gone through a really big loss two or three years ago. And when they told someone they were coming to the retreat, they were like, oh, you're still doing that grief thing? It's been like two years, you know? And it's like, my husband of 40 years died. <laughs> two years is not very long. I'm still, yeah, I'm still working on the grief. Still, that's not like another, I'm doing for your sixth book. You're still doing that grief thing? <laughs> the, um, what was I going to say? What I'm curious for you as your involve, evol- involvement, not only, I guess, partially with your personal grief and all of the work that you're doing and have done, has anything changed for you in regards to like, have you ever like written anything? And then now five years later, you feel different about a certain thing. Like, is it, what was like the biggest change in your perspective through grief, either professionally or your own? Has there been anything? It's a good question. Um, I've kind of written through all of my processing of grief. So this second book I wrote was, it's called After This, When Life Is Over, Where Do We Go? And it's all about exploring different realms of the afterlife and how that's kind of a stage of grief in its own right. It's rare to meet someone who's gone through a big loss and not stop to really kind of question like, where is my person? Can I connect with them? Will I see them again? Are they okay? Can they see me? It doesn't matter what you were raised with or what you believe. There's a part of you when you miss someone so much that you, you just start to wonder these things in a new way. So that was a phase of grief that I went through and then Mm -hmm. wrote about it. And then I wrote about this anxiety piece because no one still, that that book came out four or five years ago and nobody was talking about grief and anxiety. Yeah, it's fascinating. And it just blew my mind. But to answer your question, kind of what happens each time I put a book out is that I then get all this feedback, right? Um, And it's people like validating what I wrote about or they have more questions or I hear more stories about that topic. And so I always want to write like another book right afterwards, but the same book, but like redo it because I just Mm. get so much more information. Um, The anxiety piece, I feel like I could just keep going and going and going on it. What have you learned most about anxiety and grief? That it's so much more common than I even realized. I mean, I knew it was going on out there because I was seeing it in my clients all the time and I had gone through it myself, obviously, but I, now it's, it's so, it's so prevalent in so many people who are grieving. Um, I also, one of the things that's been really exciting to learn about it is that it's really treatable. It's really manageable. Um, I think a lot of people out there are suffering from debilitating anxiety. Um, and when you've gone through a big loss and either you were anxious before or never anxious, and then it came on after the loss, it can be debilitating. It can filter into every aspect of your life. You're worrying about your health. You're going to the doctor all the time. You're worrying about, you know, catastrophic events everywhere you go. You're worrying about the people you love, you know, all kinds of different manifestations of anxiety. The thing is, it's really treatable if you actually just start to learn about it and do some work on it and get some tools. Mm -hmm. And that really was heartening. I suffered from it for years, just kind of silently. I thought it was a separate thing than Mm -hmm. my grief. I was like, oh, I just, I'm just like, 
messed up. <laughs> like, I don't know. And then I was in a trauma class, um, a psychology trauma class. And I was like, oh, I wonder if I'm anxious because both of my parents got cancer when I was 14 and then died. <laughs> like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but on a, yeah. no one had put those pieces together in any place I could find. There were no books That's about wild. it. I know. No therapist said this to me. Okay, so most people literally, like if, if someone comes in and says, I have anxiety, they there's no, they, they, they just assume that you've had it or it's something different. They literally rarely correlate it to death. Exactly. How? And people were coming into my office after I started to write about it, who'd maybe gone through a loss like as young as you at 12. And they've been anxious for 20 years. And they're just now like, oh, I wonder if this is because my dad died when I was 12. Mm-hmm. And it's like anxiety can be so insidious. And it can also be um, one of the things I think that's, that's, tough about anxiety is that you can have it and no one knows. Like you can almost keep it silent. I could be sitting here an anxious mess, you know, feeling it run through my body or having anxious thoughts while I'm sitting here and you wouldn't necessarily know. And so people are able to conceal it really well. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I ended up in the ER with panic attacks after my mom died. They checked me out for everything, like ran all these blood tests and EKGs and all this stuff. Asked me if I did drugs because I was a teenager. And, um, they never ask me like, what's going on in your life? Had I been able to tell them my mom just died and my dad also has cancer and is super old and probably going to die soon. That makes sense that I would be anxious and having mm-hmm. panic attacks. But no, they sent me on my way and told me I just like maybe had heart palpitations. Okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, that yeah. was like another place where I was like, oh, that's a different thing than my grief or this has nothing to do with my loss, you know? So the treatability of that, do you find that I'm sure there's many methods, but your approach with the four steps that you we discussed is that you, you think that's applicable to anxiety or mm-hmm. almost anything? Like, I feel like even if it's outside of grief, those four steps it can be interchange. Like the word grief could be interchangeable. Yeah, I think um, because I, what I see, what I've really come to understand about like anxious grief is that it comes for two reasons. Um, one is like untreated grief. Like you're suppressing your grief. You're not acknowledging it. You're not being supported in your grief in your life. And so in that you get anxious as a result, like when you tamp grief down, it's going to spell out in some way. And anxiety is one of the most common ways it spells out. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece is the really understandable one, right? Mortality, kind of understanding that terrible things can happen at a moment's notice and that new way of being in the world and seeing through that lens. But both of them are really like, you can work with both of those things. You know, you can work with your grief and start to make to space for it and feel other emotions and work through complicated layers of your loss. You can also just work on your anxiety and begin to learn how to, you know, calm your nervous system, like do healthy things to keep your anxiety lower or understand how it works. Look at your anxious thoughts. Yeah. I think, I think that kind of the looking at the, the anxious thoughts maybe coincided with triggers. And I was listening to someone about triggers recently. And I've discussed this. It's like we, I feel like when triggers happen, people tend to run away from those triggers and, and get whatever feelings towards it. Right. But to me, triggers is just letting you know that you have something to figure out. Totally. Like exactly. I think triggers are looked at in like a negative way. And they now triggers are used very loosely, you know, politically and all that mm-hmm. stuff. And I'm not going to go into that. But it tends to be like shut that trigger down as opposed mm-hmm. to approaching the trigger from a place of... And that's what I mean when I like lean into it, yes. you know? That's, that's literally... It's like a great. yellow cautionary light. It wants you to stop and look around and see what's going on. Yeah, so triggers are a good thing. It's mm-hmm. hard in the moment, but I think triggers are a really good thing. It like bring, yeah. brings things up. I, I got triggered by something recently that person said, and it took me in a whole rabbit hole of a, of why, and it, it was healing. Yeah. I don't have to get into what, what the trigger was. I'll keep that maybe off the mic, but it was like a beautiful moment because I was, I felt like, I, I don't feel like I get triggered very often and I felt something like, oh shit, what is this? Mm-hmm. And then I re- connected the dots and I was like, oh, but it was like a healing trigger. It was, yeah. it was like a realization trigger. It wasn't a trigger of, I still have stuff to work out, but maybe at the same time it was, but it was like a, it was a, it was an alert bell. And then I realized it and then I worked its way out and I feel like it was like a closed door mm-hmm. due to a trigger. Exactly. And that's like, that's my whole approach to like, rather than slamming the door on that stuff, let's lean into it. Let's get to know it. Let's work with it. And like, by all means, get support. Some of this stuff is too hard to do on your own. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the piece where a lot of people get tripped up yeah. is they think they're supposed to like, as my dad would tough it, tough it through. Um, 
but it's really hard. I think we need to talk about this a lot. I think grief um, needs community, which is something you're providing, um, which is something I'm always trying to provide too. I think we need to be around other people where we can make bad jokes or we can just cry and have someone really get it, what it means to walk through life without a parent or mm -hmm. all of these things. Yeah. Speaking of a bad joke, I've been, I realize I have a hole in my sock if you're watching on YouTube. So we're going to talk about the grief of my sock next time you come on. Um, I want to thank you for hopping on. You, uh, your door is always open for you, whether you write a book or not. I'm just going to come hang out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah, you should. We should. And again, I know we've discussed it. We should try to figure out more things to do together just for fun and obviously totally. promoting what we're doing. That'd be great. But uh, you're just very easy to talk to. It's always a blast seeing you. I'm sorry. It's I invited fun. myself over here because I have fun talking I to you. <laughs> I appreciate See, That's what I love about you because I, 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 I would, I, I we discussed like working together more in whatever collabs capacity. So like, you, I think you know by now you could always just ask me because the door's open. Let me know if you need a co-host. You know, I, I, have other, I have another thought on that that I don't know if you'll ever be down for something like this, but it'd be interesting coming from your approach because I'm, I'm going to be collabing with um, someone else in regards to doing my street interviews. Nice. If, you, I, if you ever feel like spending an hour time on the street, it might be interesting to have you talk to people on the street. That sounds actually really fun. It's, it's a fucking blast. It's a, <laughs> I've gone to some weird places in Venice that's always like a circus out there, but it's, it's actually hilarious. So maybe that's something we can actually discuss. So that stay tuned good. and subscribe to my Patreon for five dollars to see that content. Now, um, but, Hit subscribe, yeah, like, <laughs> like, share, like, like, share like, it. dislike, whatever. Um, but Claire, I, uh, to get to exit out of here properly, uh, I'm going to plug all your information regarding your your book that will be out by the time this episode drops. So you can just click the link below to find her book. But is there as an exit strategy? Is there what do you? It might be redundant, but what are you hoping people? that are reading your book, like, what is your mission that they get out of it? Oh, I just hope they give themselves permission, you know, to really like acknowledge that loss and grief are big and give themselves permission to find space for it and mm -hmm. uh, get support for it and not feel alone, like not feel alone in it. Yeah. Even if you feel literally alone because you don't have the support, there are communities that will help you. Yeah. Whether it's, like I said, your book, someone else's book, this podcast, another podcast, uh, there's, there's ways to do it. It's not always like a physical closeness sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I think it's more just an emotional closeness. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes I think it's all we need. I've been, I, I keep repeating that phrase lately. Um, in grief or after loss, um, friends become strangers and strangers become friends. You mm -hmm. know, happens a lot. And that's true. You can find these just strangers who make you feel less alone because they know your grief. I love that. And uh, remind everyone the name of your book. Conscious Grieving. Conscious Grieving. Available now because... It's not out yet, but when you listen to this, it will be. So thank you again, Claire Bidwell-Smith. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Until next time, thanks for tuning in. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. That'll give you updates as to when we post a new video, more episodes, and more content in general. We are streaming on all the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and all that. And also find us on Instagram at Dead Talks Podcast or www.deadtalks.net. Thank you so much.